So this is Mrs. T's Chem Talk, Regions Chem, Atomic Concepts, one of the videos that you can find on my YouTube channel. So if you find this one helpful, please visit the channel for the other videos um, that I have made for chemistry. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Mrs. T. I'm a chemistry teacher at Calhoun High School in Merrick, New York, and hopefully this will be helpful for you. So first we're going to start with a little bit of history of atomic models. And when we talk about the history, the, um, what we need to keep in mind is that just like any scientific concept, it is going to be a result of many experiments by many scientists over many, many years. So scientific theories and scientific ideas do not just come about based on one scientist or one experiment, but it's many scientists over many years and many experiments. We refine and develop theories uh, constantly when new information comes about. So for the timeline, the first people to discuss atoms in general were the Greek philosophers, and they had just the general idea that if we broke things down and broke things down and broke things down, eventually we'd get to something that was indivisible, which they called atomos. Um, then there was Dalton, who talked about gases and talked about fixed proportions versus um, multiple, multiple proportions. He had his experiments. J.J. Thompson did some experiments where he talked, uh, where he dis discovered the electron. We also had Rutherford's gold foil experiment, and then finally Bohr, who did his experiments and came up with the quantized electrons. The modern model and the wave mechanical model are synonyms for each other, and that's our current ideas about atoms after all of these experiments and all of these years and all of the information that has come to pl come to pass the modern model and the wave mechanical model is the one that we think is the most accurate at this point when we talk about the early experiments Dalton performed experiments with gases and he said that all elements are made of atoms atoms of one element are like each other but different from atoms of other elements and he said that atoms of different elements combine in fixed proportions to make compounds. So sometimes you'll see this information where something has a fixed proportion. That's supposed to ring a bell for you that that's talking about a compound. If something has multiple possible different ratios or proportions, that would have to be a mixture. Thomson was another early atom experimenter. He performed the cathode ray experiment where he discovered that there is actually negative charged matter or negatively charged something that comes off of atoms so he was able to discover electrons. He found that atoms can be broken into smaller pieces so we do have smaller pieces that make up the atom and the first one again that was discovered by him was the electron. He came up with the plum pudding model where he put all of the positives and negatives evenly distributed in the atom. The Rutherford gold foil experiment came next and further refined the thoughts about atoms and what he did he shot high speed alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil most of these alpha particles went straight through that would be um, like number one here most of them went straight through that brought him to conclude that atoms are made up of mostly empty space some of the alpha particles were deflected back as if they came really close to something and then hit it and came back. So that would be like number three here. They were deflected back. That gave him the idea that atoms have a positive dense nucleus. So now what, what Rutherford's experiment has done is that it has taken the evenly distributed positives and negatives and put the positives in a dense small center and the negatives around the outside. So he has refined Thompson's evenly distributed positive and negative idea about the atom and said no, the positives are in a dense nucleus and the negatives surround the nucleus in this empty space. We also have the Bohr model where um, Niels Bohr did some experiments and he found that electrons are quantized. They're in specific energy levels. So he said that the protons and the neutral neutrons, uh, positive protons and neutral neutrons are found in the nucleus and that the negative electrons are found in fixed path orbits 
going around the nucleus. He said this was like the planetary model. Okay, so he said it was like if you think about the way the planets orbit the sun, that's the way that the negative electrons orbit the nucleus. This helps us visualize the atom, and as I told you in class, it's many times found on t-shirts and diagrams, but it's actually fundamentally wrong. So the modern model, which is also called the wave mechanical model, still puts the positive protons and the neutral neutrons inside the nucleus. But now we say that the negative electrons are found in orbitals. These orbitals are areas of high probability where we will most likely find the electrons. We can't say exactly where they are, but we can say where they most likely will be. And again, it's also called the wave mechanical model. So you can see that right from the start with the Greeks and their idea of atoms and then Dalton and Thomson and all of and um, Rutherford and Bohr and the modern model that there have been many different ideas about the atom and each time new information is available, the ideas about the atom become refined. So again, the modern model is correct, but is difficult to visualize, which is why the Bohr model is usually used in diagrams. When we talk about atomic notation, we are going to have a mass number on top with an atomic number on the bottom if we're talking about a specific atom. So again, this would be our mass number right here, and the atomic number would be at the bottom. The mass number is always a whole number. If we take the mass number and we subtract the atomic number, we're going to get the number of neutrons. So for example, if we do 224 minus 86, that tells us that there are 138 neutrons in this particular atom. There's also, the atomic number tells us that there is 86 protons, and in a neutral atom of this, um, in this if it's because it's a neutral atom, also has 86 electrons, 138 neutrons. So atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. Uh, it's also the number of electrons because atoms are always neutral. If we had a charged ion, the electron number would change. And the mass number is the sum of protons and neutrons in the atom. When we talk about isotopes, isotopes are going to be atoms of the same element, which means they have the same atomic number and the same number of protons because the number of protons is what determines what element that we have. They're going to have different mass numbers, which means that they have different numbers of neutrons. For example, if we have radon-224 and radon-222, uh, I should say, so radon-224 has a mass number of 224, radon-222 has a mass number of 222, but notice that they each have the same atomic number and the same symbol. When we subtract 224 minus 86, we get 138 neutrons. 222 minus 86, we get 136 neutrons. So they're atoms of the same element with the same symbol and the same atomic number, but with different numbers of neutrons. That's why we call them isotopes of each other. Atomic mass is going to be the mass that we find on the periodic table, and it's usually a decimal number. You'll see that there's very, there are very few whole numbers on the periodic table. The whole numbers on the periodic table are mass numbers. The ones with decimals are the weighted average mass of the naturally occurring isotopes, and we call those the atomic masses. For example, if we wanted to find an atomic mass, we might see a question that says chlorine is made up of two naturally occurring isotopes. 25% of the isotopes have a mass of 37 atomic mass units, and 75% of the isotopes have a mass of 35 atomic mass units. Find the average atomic mass. We are going to do what's called a weighted average. We are going to take the percentage times each mass, and we're going to get a number for each of those. So 25% of 37 is 9.25. 75% of 35 is 26.25. And then we're just simply going to add those together. We never divide the end result when doing a weighted average mass. And what you'll find is that because 75% is the higher percentage, the average 
the weighted average is closer to 35 than it is to 37. When we talk about electron configurations, those are also shown on the periodic table. And it gives the number of electrons in each shell or level or principal energy level. The ones that are listed first are closer to the nucleus. Those electrons have less energy. If they're listed closer to the end of the configuration, they have more energy and they are further away from the nucleus. For example, if we look at the little box on the periodic table for nitrogen, we can see that the electron configuration is 2-5 and what that means is that the nitrogen nucleus has seven protons and some number of neutrons that we don't know because this remember is not the mass number so there's some number of neutrons and then outside the nucleus in the first principal energy level we have two electrons and in the second principal energy level, we have five. Now notice again, this is a Bohr model. The electrons are not actually going in orbits. The first two electrons are in orbitals in the first shell, somewhere within the first level. And the second um, shell has five electrons that are also in orbitals. Remember these electrons, we show it in the Bohr model because it's easier to see and visualize, but it's not exactly correct. The wave mechanical model tells us that these electrons are in orbitals, not fixed paths. Talking about electron configuration, we have something called the ground state and we have something called the excited state. Ground state electron configurations are found on the periodic table and they show the lowest possible electron configuration for that atom. So when the electrons are in the lowest possible configuration, we find that one on the periodic table. We call that the ground state. When an atom absorbs energy in any form, the electrons may move to higher energy levels. This higher energy level state is called the excited state. And when we're in the excited state, we might have electrons move out further away from the nucleus. So let's say we go back to nitrogen, which had the electron configuration 2-5. These electrons have two in the first shell and five in the second shell. If this absorbs energy, maybe the electron configuration goes to 1-6. One, one of these electrons might move out, and this would be the excited state, if I could spell, I don't know why I can't spell right now. This would be the excited or state or a possible excited state. But notice it's still a total of seven electrons, right? Two and five was seven, one and six is seven, but now the electrons are further away from the nucleus. At least one of them has moved out. And this will be a temporary situation. Eventually, this extra electron in the second shell will move back to the first shell where it belongs. When that happens, we'll form what's called the bright line spectrum. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you see an example of some bright line spectra for hydrogen, helium, neon, and sodium. And then there's a mixture at the bottom there. When an atom has electrons in the excited state, it's a temporary condition. So they'll eventually return to the ground state and they'll release energy always in the form of light. The light that is released can be broken down by a, a sort of a prism into banding pattern and that is called the bright line spectrum. Every element has a unique bright line spectrum so we can identify components of a mixture by matching the spectrum produced to the spectra of known elements. So what we're going to do here is just show where these lines came from. So if we look at my mixture, my mixture has some of the pieces that come from here. So for example, I can tell that helium is in my mixture or might be in my mixture because I have some of the bands from helium and I can see that maybe hydrogen is in there too, but only if I have all of the bands from the known elements in the mixture can I say that those elements are also in the mixture. So for example, I can say that neon is definitely not in the mixture 
because there would have to be all of these extra lines that are not there. This was the Atomic Concepts review video for Mrs. T's Chem Talk. Hopefully this was helpful. My students, if you're still having trouble on this concept, please feel free to visit me in extra help before or after school. If you're not one of my students, please go back to the YouTube channel and you can see some other videos that hopefully will be helpful for you. Have a good day. Happy studying.